Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our uh, webinar for our new product launch. And uh, we're very happy to see you here today. And uh, I'm looking at my participant screen right now, and there's people all over the globe that are actually logging in as we speak. It's really cool because it kind of validates the phrase, the world is a very small place. And it's kind of nice to be able to have like a quick little spot where a lot of the scientists and analysts can actually uh, get together and chat a little bit about the sciences and things that are happening in the science per se. So uh, I'm going to quickly go through our agenda today. So introduction, my name is Patrick Sabarin. I am the business development and application specialist for North America. I'm actually also, uh, I do do some uh, work on hardware as well. So sometimes I'm able to help out within that capacity. And as part of the introduction, I'm going to chat a little bit more later about uh, Lumex Instruments in a few seconds. But uh, to continue on our agenda, we have, uh, we're going to have a video of our newest family member because this webinar is about this new product launch. And uh, with this video, you'll be able to get like a quick demo, a quick sense of the uh, our newest instrument there in our Cavalry Electroforces family. So you'll see it's pretty cool and you will actually be able to see all the advantages and the uh, perks that come with that new instrument. After that, we're gonna take a brief little section here to actually take questions from the audience. You'll notice right now that we are actually recording the webinar and we are all you've also have all your microphones muted, but I will uh, enable you to unmute your microphones for uh, that the uh, question period. And then after that, everything will be muted again for the rest of the presentation. And once we get to another section for questions, the microphones will also be unmuted so that you can ask your question verbally. You can also use the chat. I think most of you know how the Zoom meeting works because you probably have been to so many of them in the past couple of years, right? So, and then what we're going to do is we'll talk about, we've decided to add another, another ingredient uh, as part of the presentation, and it's going to be talking about application development in a difficult matrix. So, Typically, you know, a lot of the results are reported with standards that are ran on our systems. And of course, everything works well because, well, let's face it, the standards, right? They're, they're in water. And then when we come down to our actual samples, well, guess what? They're not in water. So we kind of have to do a few things in order to get them to adapt in and uh, prepare them so that they can be analyzed on the systems. And uh, I wanted to touch base on that today because it's uh, it's a nice little piece of uh, of uh, knowledge that uh, we we would like to share. So it's something that we're actually working on right now. And then finally, we'll finish off with a uh, quick uh, final question and answer. If you guys have any questions at all about the application that that we're we're going to talk about, and also about the new instrument. All right. With that being said, uh, part of the introduction is we are Lumex Instruments Canada. We are located in uh, Mission, British Columbia. The uh, phone number here on the screen that you're seeing, if uh, you're able to see it, it, it most likely will be my colleague Alvin or my other colleague Tatiana that's going to pick up the phone and redirect your call to whomever you need to talk to in terms of that. But the Canadian office is located in Mission, British Columbia, and any inquiries actually around the world will show up in our inboxes, and we're able to redirect the uh, the uh, uh, email to the appropriate people. Our instrument portfolio, I can't really uh, do this webinar without chatting a little bit about instruments because we are a instrument manufacturer. So of course, there's several instruments that we have out there to enable you to uh, resolve any type of analytical task. 
And one of the instruments we have there is this little guy here. This is the Fluorat O2. There's the 4M and the 5M model. And we typically sell this uh, unit for TPH in water and in soil, but it can do so many more, much more analyses as well, like vitamin B, it could do uranium, it could also do turbidity, and uh, the list goes on and on as far as what this thing can do. It's really nice instrument because you can actually use it as a standalone unit or it could be connected to the software as well. So you can store standalone your calibration curves and get your unknowns right on the spot. Or you can use the computer as you're accustomed to using for other pieces of equipment. The next guy in line is our flagship product. And this is our mercury analyzer. It's the RA915. The model you're seeing here is the M model. A lot of people actually have this model in their lab if they're doing any mercury monitoring whatsoever. And this model can do uh, the three types of samples, soil, liquids, and air. Uh, we just need to have the appropriate attachments to do water and then the appropriate attachments to do soils and fish and other solids as well. And uh, of course, uh, with that being said, we've actually also have a newer member of the family, but this one actually is uh, about two years old now. It's our RA915 lab, and this guy can do soils and water. But what's cool about this particular instrument is that it's fully automated. It's got an auto sampler for 47 samples, and it will analyze mercury in the two sample types that I've just enumerated. Next in line here are our uh, infrared uh, product lines. And this one here is our FT12. This is our near infrared system, which is very popular in... Uh, in bakeries, actually we're getting a lot of traction now for meat analysis and uh, food uh, fed, uh, for uh, animal feeds and also, believe it or not, pet shop. So uh, pet shop foods as, uh, is, is uh, becoming popular on this. So that, that's pretty cool. Uh, we've got several other applications on the go. Dairy as well is one of them. And this is probably one of the most simplest instruments I've ever had to use in my life, in my career as a, an analytical chemist. And you just basically really just put the sample in a cell, press a button, and it'll actually give you in 90 seconds all the results that you want. So that's pretty cool. Next in line here is our, and also in the infrared, but that's the mid-range infrared, is our FT08. And this would be our uh, basic FTIR that you're uh, already accustomed of seeing in several labs. The particularity for this one is that we have a very big sample compartment, so we can have several attachments that can be uh, that can be put on this particular instrument, such as a an infrared microscope, an ATR, a cell, etc. So basically, it's very versatile in terms of how you want to start to doing your infrared analyses. This one here is our graphite furnace atomic absorption spectrometer. And what's really neat about this instrument is that it's a very small footprint. And I don't have the dimensions right off my, uh, my uh, the bat here, but typically it's very small. It actually has also a 47 sample compartment as well. So you can analyze the uh, 47 samples in the auto sampler. It also accommodates six different lamps. So you can analyze six different elements as you go as well. Next in line here, we've got our, uh, that's our solution for our real-time PCR. So if you're doing any real-time PCR, Ariadna is what this instrument is called. And this one's actually really neat. It does 45 cycles in 20 minutes. It actually uses microchip base uh, PCR. So what that means is you save a lot of money on the reagents that you're using to run PCR. And uh, of course, this uh, instrument does several types. Uh, it's got several types of assays that it's lined up to. 
And uh, of course, if you have any questions for that, feel free to ask us. We'll be more than happy to, to follow up. And then last but not least is our capillary electrophoresis system portfolio. So the one you're seeing right there is the CAPL 205. I also have one right here in the back of me. And the CAPL 205 is the uh, larger throughput for samples model that you that we have. We also have the 105M, and we also have our newer member of the family. Uh, okay, whoops, the image isn't clear, so I guess I must have forgotten my glasses to take this picture. Uh, <laughs> all right, so what I'm going to do, this is a good time then to pause here and actually launch the video for our newest member of the family. So uh, I'll be doing that in the, the next minute. nothing to it, just carry it like a normal bag or whatever, just put it down on the table, that's it, don't shake it, don't tip it over, keep it vertical. Presenting the newest member of our capillary electrophoresis family, the Capital 115! And that's my dramatic entrance for today. The Kappel 115 was born from a need to have a high performing portable analytical system. It has a width of 290 millimeters, a height of 460 millimeters, and a length of 385 millimeters. It weighs 15 kilograms, which makes it easy to be portable. It has a built-in battery that can be used in continuous operation for five hours for those difficult places in the field where electrical outlets might not be available. It also runs on standard power and has all the features you will find on our benchtop models that are the Kappel 105M and the Kappel 205. It can rinse your capillary at pressures varying from 500 to 2000 millibars. It can do electrokinetic injections in one kilovolt steps and also can do pressure injections from minus 100 to plus 100 millibars in one millibar steps as well. It has a 10 position auto sampler both on the inlet and the outlet side. It will run your separations at minus 30 to plus 30 kilovolts in a 1 kilovolt step increment and will go up to 300 microamps of current. It will also detect your components from a range of 190 to 380 nanometers. And as you saw in the introduction, it is super portable and can be used in the laboratory as a benchtop unit or in the field to be close to where the action is. In order to set up your Kappel 115 to be in ready mode for your daily analyses, all you need is to perform the following steps. Number one, make sure that your water level is good to ensure proper capillary cooling. Number two, make sure that you have installed a cassette before we power up the unit. Number three, power up the unit. There are two switches on the Kappel 115. There's a switch in the back that powers up all the electronics and there's a switch in the front that powers up all the rest that is needed for regular operations. Once both those switches are on, the system will power up 
and we'll go through its initialization sequence. The Capel 115 runs on our easy to use software called Elfo Run. So once we've powered up the unit, we are able to launch Elfo Run. And to launch it, you simply need to go into the programs menu, find the Elfo Run icon and just click on it to launch it. Once the software is launched, there will be a dialog window that will pop up to enter your username. Just enter it and then click OK. Once this is done, the software will ask you to start the thermostating action. Enter your operating temperature, typically it's 20 degrees C, and click Yes. Because the unit was powered on using the front and the back switches, the lamp in this example is going to be automatically turned on, so no further action is required for turning the lamp on. And that's it. These are all the steps you need to do. You'll have to wait for your system to warm up 30 minutes before you start your first run. So while the system is warming up, we will stop here to answer any questions you might have on the Capel 115 before we jump into our next segment. Thank you for listening. All right, so we're back, and I've actually enabled you to, uh, to uh, unmute yourself if you have any questions regarding this, uh, this new instrument, the Capel 115. And uh, while uh, you guys think of what you need to say, uh, like we were saying, it's uh, basically a uh, was born from a need to be to have like a portable unit that can be right on the field, close to where we need to do the uh, sampling. As far as uh, that's why we have this uh, instrument developed. The other thing also is. It actually goes to 30,000 volts, so that's another high feature of this particular unit because there were some units that sometimes can't quite reach that, that uh, separation voltage. As well, it has a uh, five-hour battery, as mentioned in the video, and, and ca it can be shipped to other locations. We uh, actually have a sheet that identifies the battery, and it's safe for, uh, for you to ship this unit from uh, one place to another without any issues. You can also order a Pelican case for this particular model and uh, make sure that you store it in that. And uh, what's crazy is that you can actually walk uh, with this uh, in a lab and set it up right on the uh, bench and start your experiment. So I see someone's got a, their hands up. And please go ahead and, uh, and uh, speak up. Keba. Good afternoon, Patrick. Good afternoon. Great, great, great presentation. Um, great stuff. Um, it's great that you guys brought this new model in the market, something that could help uh, people out in the field. Like you said, um, to get the axon close to where you know, things are happening. Yeah. Uh, my question is, um, be, the, depending on the size, does the size of this new capillary, a uh, new Capel affect the size of the cartridge or the kind of cartridge that you need for it? Is it a different set of cartridge or would it take the same cartridge as the previous models? All right, great question. Actually, it does take the cartridge of the 105M and the cartridge for the 205 is uh, slightly different than these. However, and I'm glad you brought this question up, uh, we are actually working on uniformizing the cartridges across all of our platforms. And uh, that way we're going to be able to uh, take the cassette out and we could simply just replace the cassette in a different instrument and go ahead and start analyzing as far as that goes. As you've seen in the presentation, the cassette is quite simple to take out and, uh, and take in. 
and uh, well, a couple of my customers that are already using the 205, and I've got a customer online actually listening to this presentation that's ran the uh, 115 extensively on the field as well. So that's kind of cool, and uh, they're uh, very satisfied with it. So as far as that goes, uh, the cartridges, there's some compatibility with the 105M, and we're working to get the 205 compatible as well. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right, I see a few things in the chat. Let's see. Okay, reproducibility about the CAPL 115. So the reproducibility, depending on what you're actually analyzing uh, for the, uh, the uh, standard IQ test that we do when we do the installation and everything, they're highly comparable to all the other modules that we actually install out there. So reproducibility is below 3% on both migration time and area as far as that goes. Now on different applications, the reproducibility can uh, vary in terms of depending on uh, the uh, species that you're looking at, how, how uh, much of it that you have. And of course, the lower concentrations will always have a higher, higher RSD than the higher concentrations. And of course, you guys know all of this as well. So typically, we like to see if we're doing like a calibration curve and we're doing a, uh, a QC check standard within that calibration curve, what we like to see is we like to see something that's below 20% of the recalculating concentration. So uh, that's not reproducibility, actually. That's more of a uh, validating the uh, curve, per se. Any other questions? OK, we're looking good here. So uh, perfect. Let me move on, then, to our next thing, and the next thing was to talk about the uh, application development in a difficult matrix. So it's a project that we're working on right now in the lab. Uh, the actual video that I was uh, filming and taking pictures of the unit and everything was while I was doing this. And the uh, difficult matrix itself is uh, called Meg, M-E-G. So here I am working with Meg. Oops, sorry. Someone messed up with my pictures again. <laughs> That's not the right Meg. Here we go again. Let me try one more time. All right, there we go. So this is Meg, the one that we're working in. So monoethylene glycol, the samples are contained in the uh, monoethylene glycol, uh, actually the ions that we need to determine. And for the results that I'm going to share with you guys, I've actually only done the cation analysis, but uh, we also did the anions as well. But for uh, demonstrating this on the, uh, on the uh, webinar today, I'm only going to be showing you cations of this particular uh, sample. So uh, matrix, sorry. So if we go back here and uh, here, I'm going to click on this. It's upside down, but it'll come right side up. So here I'm in the lab. And uh, of course, we're not going to watch this four minute and a half video of me shaking the sample and mixing it because you guys all know how to do this <laughs> as well. Um, typically, uh, here, what I'm doing is, uh, of course, I'm mixing the sample, but the samples will receive in this fashion, uh, in this tube. And then if we fast forward on the mixing part, wanted to make sure that everything was very well mixed. It is a highly viscous uh, matrix, of course. You guys already kind of know this. So here I'm actually getting ready to do the sampling. What I want to show you here is uh, I'm going to be transferring the uh, sample into my Eppendorf test tube. And it's the just a regular Eppendorf test tube that we use to do the uh, analysis here. And uh, we can actually transfer that 
Eppendorf straight on to the uh, Capel 115. Of course, what we'll do is we'll transfer the sample in. Then after that, mix centrifuge and then put the uh, the uh, Eppendorf tube inside the Capel 115. So I'll move it a little bit forward just to show you. What I want to show you is you can actually see the matrix going in, which I think is pretty cool because uh, hopefully the video quality is good enough so that you guys can actually see this. But uh, you can actually see some droplets forming in there and being added onto the test tube. All right. So with this being said, so that the sample then was, what I did is I had a 10X and a 25X dilution done for this method development. And uh, what I wanted to do is to run both of these dilutions and check and see what I get. So when you're doing methods development, even with a difficult matrix, you can actually do a series of three to five dilutions, check and see where things are going to, uh, to be uh, not saturated on the capillary and the detection window. And even to a point where if there's too much ionic uh, presence inside the capillary, even though we're injecting like a plug of a few nanoliters, it could still crash the current on your capillary and cause the analyses not to uh, to occur. So be aware of that. Uh, typically, there's even some people that will measure the conductivity of their samples. And sometimes just dilution might not do the case. We might have to do other sample preparations, such as a, uh, a solid phase extraction, basically. Here, what I did is I did the dilution. Since there wasn't any particles or anything, I did not filter the sample. However, I do strongly recommend that we do filter samples using a 0.45 micron nylon type filter. But if you don't see any particulates, you can use the sample as is. The danger here is you might clog your capillary. So speaking of clogging capillaries, let's move on to this next slide here. And here we go. So you've seen this in the previous video where I'm telling you where we can do pressures, uh, rinse pressures of the capillary. But here what I want you to take close attention to is the droplet right there. I'll actually move a little closer uh, uh, later on the video to this droplet. The uh, thing that I do when I train my customers is when we're doing a high pressure rinse, I always tell my customers the very first time you run a rinse, check for that droplet at the tip of your capillary because that actually tells you, okay, your capillary is operational and you won't have too many problems. As you've seen here, I've moved in a little closer. You can probably see the droplet being formed and the other droplet just fell down. So that's a good indication that my capillary is ready to go and we're ready to do analyses. So what I'm doing right now is I'm actually doing a uh, pressure rinse and there's two types of pressure of, uh, of, um, of liquids that we're pushing through the capillary for this cation uh, application. Let me show you this. And so I'm gonna share my other screen right here. And I'm going to share the Alpha Run software. So you guys are seeing this now. All right. Uh, what I wanted to talk about is uh, just before I jump into the samples, what I wanted to talk about is this particular part right there where it says uh, rinse. And uh, of course, here what you're seeing is the program that we've used to, uh, to do the rinses. So for the cation method, we actually do a pressure rinse from position one to seven, and then, and then position two to seven as well. So uh, hopefully you guys can see this. I just got a message saying that you can see it now. 
and uh, okay then uh, that means we're doing a pressure from vial one to vial seven of water through the capillary. And then we're doing another rinse pressure with the uh, background electrolyte to condition the capillary. And this is for uh, three minutes at uh, 1000 millibars. So the droplet you were seeing there was de generated by these, these uh, rinse pressures. And after that, we do an injection of the uh, whatever we're analyzing here. So in this particular case, it would have been standard one. And then we apply a plus 25 kilovolt current at 267 nanometers. And we're actually doing a, uh, a uh, indirect detection. So what we're doing is we're actually seeing uh, transmittance and not absorbance. And the thing, the reason why we do indirect detection is we want to flip the image around so that the software is able to integrate the peaks. And uh, okay, so I had my 0.5 ppm here. Let me open this up. Perfect. So what I was saying, hopefully this will give you a good recap. And again, I'm terribly sorry of what happened here. Um, I've injected the uh, the standards to produce a standard curve of the samples in MEG. And here we go. The uh, 0.5 ppm standard is right here. And here what we see is the, the species that we're looking at for uh, the positive uh, ionic species. So ammonia, potassium, sodium, lithium, magnesium, strontium, beryllium, and calcium. And right here, let me go back to the other here. So this is the 5 ppm. Actually, in the 5 ppm, you'll see that the peaks have a little bit higher and taller, of course, because we're higher concentrations. And then last but not least, we ran a 50 ppm curve. And this is according to the uh, note that we have in the uh, this application that we run for uh, cations. And these standards actually produce this curve. So uh, the curve and the integration events in Alpha Run are stored into the method. So if I click on open method here, you'll actually see my cation method there. If I open it up, you'll see the calibration curve here. So the one you're seeing right now is of ammonia. And if we go all the way to other elements in the curve, so potassium. So as you can see, the curve is, is nice. We're seeing 0.999. It's getting sort of forced through zero as well. It's a linear response, and we're using area to calculate the concentration from the calibration curve. Uh, so all the elements are pretty much showing a value of 0.999. And of course, the response of the curve depends on the elements themselves, as you would know. So this is all part of the method. These are the files here that are, are composing the calibration curve. And you can actually add multiple repeats and add those files on there and be able to have a calibration curve that's produced for from more than one point. You can have multiple points of the same concentration. So that's a pretty neat. And this is this happens right in here in what we call the method. So I'm going to close this window up now. And since you've seen the calibration curve and the standards, I'm going to close the standards as well. But just before I jump into the sample, there's one last little tool I wanted to show you, which I think is really helpful. And it's the, uh, let me grab my keyboard right here. All right. So it's this tool right there. When sometimes people are having difficulties to identify species, you can actually open your uh, EPGs. So uh, the EPGs are our electropherograms in a set. And once that is done, what you can do is you can kind of shift them 
in the y-axis. So we'll go a little lower here. And then for the top concentration, I'm going to go a little higher there. Now you can actually see the uh, all the species coming out with their migration times. And as you can see, for the standard, everything's pretty close to each other. And then, of course, that's what's expected from a standard. As far as that goes, this is kind of what we where we want to be. All right. So now with that little trick shown up, I'm going to close this off. And now we're going to go into the actual discussion of the uh, samples themselves. So sample 99 is the first one I'm going to start with. We're going to open these up. And I'm not going to open them in a set. I'm actually going to open them individually. And as you can see, the 10x, there's nothing that's being identified. So uh, pretty much just a straight baseline. So of course, if my 10x dilution, which is my more concentrated sample, is not showing me any peaks, I would expect my 25x dilution to do the same exact thing. So I've... Uh, Basically, for this particular sample, uh, we were not able to determine the presence of any ionic species. So we've decided to specify it as undetermined. So I'm going to close these off. And we're going to jump into the next sample set that I did for 10x and 25x. And it's the sample label 90. Here we go. All right. So here's my 10x. And now with this one, yeah, we're seeing potassium, sodium, magnesium, and calcium as being reported. And we are also able to see a concentration that was calculated from the curve that I was showing you earlier. So this concentration value here was calculated from the curve. And uh, it's using the meg cation method that I was uh, showing you the calibration curve from to do the calculations and also to do the integrations as well. So concentration is written in here. I'll close this guy up. The 25x, same thing. I've actually got the concentration calculated here for the 25x dilution sample. And we're also picking up nicely the uh, species that are picked up on the 10x. So it's actually really good as far as that goes. One thing I'd like you guys to pay attention to is you'll notice that the sodium sometimes has a particularity to have a very broad peak. And... Uh, even if you have like high concentrations of, of uh, calcium, you might see the same sort of scenario. And this is why sometimes when we're doing methods development, we ask people what if they have a sense of what to expect in terms of a ratio between the species. And if they, uh, they do have a uh, sense of the ratio, because certain ratios, if the sodium is so high, it could actually mask even even uh, to the point where it's going to be close to be masking potassium as well. So we have to be careful with that. If that happens, then we kind of have to do a special sample preparation, as previously mentioned. And last but not least, the last two samples. Here we go. This keyboard here. And these... Whoops, I've opened it in a set. That's not what I wanted to do. Sorry about that. That is kind of cool, though. But what I wanted to show you is uh, the concentration. So I'm going to do open individually. Here we go. So again, we're picking up the same scenario, potassium, sodium, magnesium, and calcium. You're seeing the 25x here for this sample. And then on this sample, 10x, of course, if we're seeing it on 25x, we're definitely going to see it on 10x as well. So now what I wanted to do is to kind of show you, so I'm going to stop sharing here, and I'm going to share another 
document with you guys. Here we go. Here we go. What I wanted to show you is this document here. So this document here is a, a nice summary of uh, the runs that I did uh, with uh, the column that says concentration 10x, concentration 25x is the numbers that were extrapolated from the electropharogram uh, report that you were seeing. The uh, numbers with calculated 10x and calculated 25x are basically just the numbers multiplied by their dilution factor. And then the difference is the difference between the calculated values uh, is in the difference column. And I've actually put in the 10% and the 20% mark of what uh, we typically, like I was saying earlier, we're normally we want something to be below 20%. So you'll notice in this particular uh, particular report now, and I'm actually reporting absolutes here. So what I, what that means is I don't actually know the real concentration. We haven't gotten that information yet. But I want. I was wondering. Okay, well, how is my 25x versus my 10x performing? So that's kind of this table here is what it's showing. It's showing a uh, 25x and a 10x concentration. And you'll notice that for the first sample, sample 90, the uh, the uh, potassium is a little on the high side. But for the rest of the species and even the other sample everything is much lower than uh, than 10%. So that means that basically the calibration curve is is pretty uh, pretty good in terms of how to being able to report concentrations. And uh, that's pretty much all I had to share with you guys on this particular uh, sample uh, matrix. And I'm going to stop the share here and go back into my other computer and share my PowerPoint. All right. So before we leave, uh, you guys should, let me make sure of that. You guys should be able to unmute yourself. Nope. Okay, now you'll be able to. So if you guys want to unmute yourself, if you have any questions for me or anything like that. So the experiment I shown you was a quick experiment that I did uh, within a day and a half of uh, running the uh, Cation uh, application. So if you guys have any questions, the uh, forum is now open. Hi. Hi. That's Maria speaking, right? Yes. All right, Maria. In the pharmaceutical industry, mm -hmm. when we work with the drug substance of the uh, product, um, we submitted them to stress conditions. We can find or not degradation products. Some of them can collude with the main analyte. How can I know? If my analyte is pure, we are not uh, we or in other words, is it possible to obtain purity with uh, this equipment? To obtain uh, uh, what? Sorry, purity. I missed that. Purity. Uh, purity. Purity. Yes, purity of the peak okay. of the analyte. Purity of the analyte. Okay. Uh, actually, yes, it is possible uh, to uh, obtain the purity based on the charge of the species. And of course, everything that uh, kind of absorbs within the uh, UV range uh, that was mentioned previously, so 190 to 380 nanometers, you will get that information as far as that goes. Now, in terms of peak purity, in a sense where you're doing a, a photodiode array type of detection, if yes. If that's where your question is going, then no, because this guy has a uh, one fixed wavelength to do the analysis. So it's just a monochromator that actually mm -hmm. goes to a fixed wavelength. Okay. Yes, I, I know that it's possible with PDA detector. 
Not well, uh, in this case, it's only it. UV. It's only UV, yes, correct. Mm, okay, thank you. You're welcome. But uh, another question. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. But, uh, uh, but uh, uh, there is um, a way to to know if my pick uh, is not with colluded with another. It's uh, possible with another way to to make or. Or yes. Not. Yes. Actually, one thing that can be possible with CE is uh, coupling the CE with mass spectrometry. So okay. That, yes. Yes. That but way. Only with the couple 115 is not possible. Well, that's something that actually can be opened up to discussion, of course. It's just a question of uh, looking at which mass spec you're going to be using. And of course, then we can work on a solution to couple it. So typically the one, the 105M, one, uh, the 205, and the 115 should be able to be coupled to mass spec. That's okay. my opinion. That's my opinion, though. So. Hi, Patrick. Um, Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Keba. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on that question, um, for us, when we are faced with HPLC and we have only UV detection um, and we're developing a method, so what sometimes we do is we find a cheaper way to do it by trying to run the same method on a mass spec. Yeah. Okay. So, like taking a, a couple of samples, run them on the mass spec. And then the mass spec would validate, you know, whatever impurities are in there. So once we are happy with our mass spec, then we go back to the HPLC or the capillary, whereby we can now well, be able to uh, validate, be able to do our routine work at a cheaper cost uh, without the coupling to the mass spec. So we run a number of samples when we develop the method on an LC on, a, on an LCMS and then once we're happy with the method and then um we can go back on the on the yeah on the HPLC. So I don't know whether similar shortcuts is also possible. With it the is CE. it is with the CE. Yes. It is with the yes. CE and uh, and with uh with uh, different uh well of course the species that we're looking at uh, since Maria you mentioned you're in the pharma industry so we're typically we know it has a specific spectrum for uv uh, and also would probably have a very well known library of uh, identifying it through mass spec as well so yes that that, that is possible mm -hmm. uh, as far as that goes and there's several ways you can do it really i mean you could Potentially for for LC, uh, even if you don't have an LC coupled to an MS, you could potentially collect the fractions and blast those into a uh, time of flight mass spec. Yes, so one, okay. One, of course, uh, but for my C, question was. Go ahead, please. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> my my question was uh, uh, with respect with the couple. 115. 115. Because, yeah. yes, 115. And because uh, we know that with LCMS, it's possible. But with, when you use um, MS detector, it's possible. But if I only, if, for example, if I haven't an MS detector, but uh, I, I need to, to check the for the yeah. reason I ask about the couple one fifteen. Yes. Well, like I said, the purity for sure, uh, and uh, because I've done it in the past by uh, by uh, CE also with the PDA, but uh, for the one one five, there there's no PDA. Uh, uh, it's a yeah. it's just a single UV wavelength, and the other so yes. the other solution to it would be true mass spec but then mass spec they're rarely portable so <laughs> they're actually pretty bulky 
So nevertheless, but still you can use this, uh, the 115 or any of our other benchtop units uh, with mm -hmm. a mass spec uh, yeah. as well. Patrick, you mentioned that you can collect. <laughs> Go on, Maria. I think that in the future, <laughs> okay. a, a Lumex mass uh, provide another <laughs> equipment with PDA. <laughs> well, there's there's some interest in mass spec, but uh, there's no uh, for now. Anyways, the solution is would be to uh, couple the uh, CE to a uh, third party mass spec. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So again, Patrick, I was thinking you, you mentioned that I mean the sample can be collected. So the the UV is non the process is non-destructive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Correct. in that in that case, if you can collect the sample, you can you know do the do a scan on a spectro on a normal spectrophotometer and be able to assess purity. So of course with CE though, as previously mentioned, we're injecting a few nanoliters. Okay. All right. So that's that's going to be tricky. Fraction collection on a CE, <laughs> uh, and a lot of people actually uh -huh. still want to do it, and I've okay. seen people doing it. And believe it or not, yes, it can be done, but uh, you kind of mm -hmm. would have to re-inject the same uh, the same uh, thing on and on again to have a certain concentration to be ordered to to be able to do say, uh, a UV uh, uh, scan, but okay. maybe for mass spec, however, it could be done like uh, like a time of flight mass spec where you could take the collection mm -hmm. of what you've done and see if you're within the uh, detection limits of the mass. Yeah, like like yeah. they do in shotgun. Yeah, yeah exactly. Shotgun. So it would be a shotgun approach, but with, certain, uh, with the front end separation. So uh, okay. not not so shotgun, let's put it that way, because we're not throwing everything at it. We're mm -hmm. just throwing a fraction of it. Correct. Anyone yeah. else has any questions? Patrick. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, go, 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 please. Go, uh, well, um, we cut the, with this uh, equipment, the injection is from inlet to outlet, yes. But it's possible to 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 make injection from outlet. Yeah, it is actually, and we actually can do a vacuum injection. We can inject from minus one hundred uh, millibars to mm. uh, to one hundred millibars. So yes, there is a, there is a possibility to do an injection from the outlet side, which we call the short end separation side. Uh, depending, of course, now uh, everyone will agree with me on this one, is that we always want the species to migrate towards the detection window or else, you know, it's not, there's not a lot of use to it. <laughs> We're just going to collect mm -hmm. a baseline. But nevertheless, yeah, you would be able to inject from the outlet side. And of course, depending on what charge the species that you want to analyze is, let's say, for instance, if I took my... Uh, my uh, positive ions, I was doing a uh, forward separation. So uh, the positive electrode was on the inlet and the negative electrode was on the outlet. If I were to inject it the other way around, then the polarity would have to change because I want my species to migrate towards the uh, electrode that attracts it, right? So positive yeah. charge will be attracted by the negative electrode. So yes, it is possible. And you have to pay attention to maybe okay. first the polarity. Yes, to change the polarity. Yes, that's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. With respect to the um, uh, the detection. Yes. Uh, the, the this couple work with the direct. Detection and indirect detection, or yes. only direct detection? It's uh, well, it's basically direct detection, but the software enables us to flip indirect detection. Yeah, the image around. I, I ask this because uh, we have some substance that uh, 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 
does doesn't absorb on okay. the UV. For yeah. this reason, we need to do, to work with uh, indirect detection. Yes. So the background electrolyte I was showing earlier with the uh, electropherograms I was showing for uh, potassium, calcium, uh, sodium, yeah. and all these ions, they're actually that that background electrolyte is absorbing. And then the peaks actually show yeah. up upside down. So it's transmitting mm -hmm. that we're seeing. So yes, if you have a highly absorbing background electrolyte, but you have molecules that will let some light true, then yes, you can definitely see transmittance. Okay, thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Uh, Alvin, you mentioned there's a question from Arif in the chat. Let's see. I've actually lost that part of the... Uh, chat unfortunately because of my little uh, disconnection mishap would you be able to read it for me oh uh, yes give me one set patrick thanks bud find it where is it now all right so the question was uh, can we use this instrument as an alternative to ic for example for ifp0803 uh, standard to measure sodium, nitrite, barium. Please talk about the, the, uh, the detection limits for this instrument. Okay. So uh, a lot of people are actually starting to use CE as an alternative to IC. One of the big reasons is uh, IC can be a little, it's a great technique, by the way, but it can be a little complicated sometimes, especially if we want to uh, deploy specific analyses in the field to users and not uh, an analytical chemists or analytical technicians out there. So ca capillary electrophoresis actually does a uh, more simpler job for these people to actually do this type of work. As you've seen the uh, I just diluted a sample and boom. So if you have a standard operating procedure, then that's that's uh, pretty much what the end users would need. And then of course, there's a little bit of interpretation that has to be uh, followed up on that, on the mix. And uh, once the people are able to identify the uh, footprint, so as you've seen, my peaks were migrating, but the migration times of the standards are pretty close on and even the samples that I had were actually pretty close on to the same migration times as well so there wasn't so much interpretation that I needed to do but sometimes it can happen that the technique might cause the sample uh, migration time to come out quicker or slower and that's due to the content of the sample so if there's a, a, a lot more ionic species that are present and that we're not necessarily detecting because remember that we're looking at uh, say a positive ions but there are negative ions as well that are present in our sample right because the caveat is when we look at negative ions we also don't see the positive ions but we see the negative ions so what's going on is there's a lot of people that are positively or negatively charged that are moving across the capillary and then of course depending on what we're targeting in the assay we are only seeing the species that we're targeting now in terms of detection limit well, the detection limit is uh, limited to uh, a few factors. One of the factors is, of course, the, uh, the limit of detection of the actual assay that you're running. So you've seen that uh, on the cation, we actually go to 0.5 ppm, and that's about as low as we go in terms of that. Uh, but there's also a way for you to go lower than that, and that, of course, is spiking your sample with a known concentration standard. And then, of course, you'll be able to kind of check and see if the there's a variation in the concentration of what you're expecting to see versus what you're actually measuring. Of course, again, there is a limit to what you can do there also. And the next criteria is the actual 
um, ratio that I've mentioned earlier of the species that you're analyzing, if the ratio is so big, so for sodium, if I'm not mistaken, the ratio should not go over 200 ppm. If it does, then it will mask. It will take over a lot of the real estate on the electropharogram, and it will mask other ions that could be either of a lower concentration, or even if they're at a higher concentration, they can be masked as well. Um, hopefully, that answers your question, RF. Um, the, uh, you mentioned a standard that I cannot give you a clear answer on that. However, I'd have to double check the uh, notes for the uh, actual standard that you've uh, referred to. But uh, nevertheless, again, as a general purpose, yeah, a lot of people are actually using CE instead of IC now because it's a much simpler technique to use. Okay, well, we went over five minutes, and unfortunately, that's due <laughs> because I lost my connection. I'm terribly sorry again about that, but nevertheless, uh, hopefully, the message came true. The, uh, like I said, again, if you guys have any other questions or anything you'd like to know, feel free to send us an email at info at lumexinstruments.com. And uh, we'll be more than happy to uh, follow up and give you an answer to this. So for now, I will give you the rest of your day. And thank you so much again for ha having to join in uh, such a high uh, participation rate. Uh, really glad to see uh, there's a lot of people there that are interested in uh, capillary electrophoresis. Take care. Have a nice day. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye.